Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Horse Geeks podcast with our little unplanned hiatus. We are back. Um, I am Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer, and with me is Deborah Marrow, certified Alexander Technique instructor. And the Horse Geeks podcast is where we just talk about random subjects that have to do with horses and look at <clears throat> horses or riding or horse training from the inside out. So, Deb, since uh, I think what we wanted to talk about today was time, since we just lost a bunch of time. We did. <laughs> I know. I looked at the calendar and I go, oh my God, it's been since December 8th that we did our last podcast. <laughs> when you said over a month, I was like, no. Yes. No way. <laughs> yes. Almost two months. Oh so, our apologies for disappearing, you guys, but we will get back on track. <laughs> It was an event filled December and January. And yes. for me, with my mare having had colic surgery the end of December or the end of November, um, she came home with an eye ulcer, a stomach ulcer, and, you know, healing up her abdominal wall where they did the, um, where they cut. And so it was kind of high maintenance through December. But I am happy to report, I actually have now had three rides on her. Wow, yay. So she's been working, doing groundwork up until recently. And I just had about three rides, which kind of segues into what we're going to talk about today, which is quality of work versus quantity of work. Mm. And she was quite clear with me, which is, I'm sure, one of the things we'll discuss that after 20 minutes of just riding at the walk, very light, easy, she sort of dragged me back over to the mounting block and she was saying, that's enough. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. That was enough. So I kind of waited for that as long as she was willing to go forward and communicate with me and have a light, easy ride. We kept going and right about the 20 minute mark, all three rides, she's like, okay, I'm going to just gently drag you towards the mounting block, which is my <laughs> signal that we're done. <clears throat> That's funny that you uh, <clears throat> put it that way, because it's interesting with my three. Um, yeah, when their time is up. That's yeah, a how really, do you know when the horse is done? That's working? a really good point. <clears throat> and sometimes when you're riding, I'm, I'm usually riding by myself. I don't have another set of eyes there to, you know, actually see what's going on. It's difficult sometimes to make the decision. Well, do I, some of the things that come up in my mind is, do I, am I pushing too much? Am I asking the right questions or am I asking the questions the right way? Mm. <clears throat> am I sending interference <clears throat> in my language? of communicating what I'm asking. So there's That's one way deep. that I use all the time <clears throat> to tell if I'm not working a horse hard enough. If I'm not working a horse hard enough, then their attention is all over the place. So mm. horses that are distracted, that are constantly looking around are sort of telling me that I'm not being provocative enough in what I'm asking them to do. So I'm not asking, I'm not challenging them enough mm. with their internal coordination or the work at hand to really grab their attention and their focus. Once I have kind of the ears half back on me and the horse is typically concentrating, like whatever signals, body language signals we get from the horse, it shows that they're concentrating, which for me is at least one ear back on me and a little bit of calming of the energy. They don't have to be 100% relaxed, but they're not escalating the energy. They're sort of de-escalating the energy. It's, it's coming down a little bit, which tells me that they're concentrating more. And especially as I'm having these conversations internally, sorry, I forgot to turn my phone off. As I'm having these conversations in internally with how the horse is using themselves, that usually keeps their focus no matter the environment I'm working in. 
I agree with that. I agree because, you know, my big mare, Callie, used, we used to call her airs above the ground because you could never get her to focus. And I think I mentioned this before. One day I'm out there and we're just really communicating really well with each other. And the UPS truck comes driving down the road. The dogs are running after the truck barking. She didn't even flinch. She was like, nope, I'm, I'm here with you. I'm focused. And let's just get down to business. Yes. So if I'm not uh, getting the horses. Point. Yeah. If I'm not getting the horse's attention, I can do things like more rapid transitions, more changes of direction, ask for something more specific, but I want to look for that place where the horse shuts out the environment and starts to concentrate on our conversation or internally with what they're doing. So that's on the side of finding enough work or enough challenge. Mm -hmm. And then I think your question, what was it you said about how do I know when I've worked too long or if I've asked too much? Uh, if I've asked too much um, or, you know, I, ha I have a bunch of questions around that, but we can work on that one for now. Yeah. I mean, certainly a physical, um, I don't know, what is too much or am I communicating properly? Am, does the horse just not understand what I'm asking? That could be. I mean, that's part of the dialogue that to me doesn't really tell me if it only tells me if I'm being provocative enough, challenging enough. Right. Right. If I'm not, then they'll shut off that conversation and just get distracted or derailed. Um, but asking, wondering if there's if we're doing too much is a really good question. And it took me years to recognize what now I I recognize quite quickly as when the horse is kind of done. And it took a long time because everybody, when we get on and ride, we're going to start off with a cold horse. So we have our warm up phase, mm -hmm. which, when it comes to the horse's balance and use during that warm up phase, is where we're going to feel the strongest forces like the strongest resistances, the most amount of distraction, the, all of the biggest problems are usually in the first five, 10, 15 minutes that we call our warm up. <clears throat> so I wanna find a warm up that gets the horse's attention on me. And then as I go through the ride, if I'm kind of on target with where the horse is learning or where we're working, then as I go through the ride, the forces that I feel through the reins or my seat or the legs become less. So the horse isn't as heavy. It, it becomes more responsive to whether it's my seat, my leg, or my rein. They become lighter to the aids, not necessarily light, but lighter than where we started in the warm up. And that tells me, okay, we're getting into the work. So for me, it's all the feel of it. And what I'm looking for, if I'm working on balance, is that the forces or the feel uh, heavier light of the horse losing steering or falling on the bit or something like that, that those, the horse becomes more responsive and lighter and the saddle becomes steadier. So I feel the whole horse go from sort of falling left or right, going too fast, going too slow, these mm. sort of big exaggerated forces yes. during the warm up, those forces become more subtle, more organized, and the movement becomes much steadier as I go through the ride. So then I know once I've passed the point of productivity, I start to feel the forces related to the imbalance. So the, the responsiveness to my leg, my seat, my reins becomes heavy again. Ah, okay. And the horse, the movement under the saddle starts to become less stable. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and it's interesting. I'm trying to think of all three of mine that, that I'm working in. It's, it's different with each one. Yes. So like I look at as each to ride, how much time that is. 
Yes, it's a, it has nothing to do with time on the clock. It yeah, has... I, I get, I hear a lot of people getting stuck on that. Um, you know, I've got an hour, so I've got to use the entire hour or whatever. Yeah. And, and then I look at me with what I've got going on and I sometimes feel guilty because I only have 30 minutes per horse having three horses that I have to work. Um, or, you know, does it, this thing, we think it has to be an hour, five days a week, or, you know, all of those thoughts that go through the human's mind of, uh, our time, which they're not on our time whatsoever. No. And the body is constantly changing and adapting. So the amount of minutes we work with the horse has a lot to do with what's going on in the environment, the weather, the physical condition of the horse, how regularly they're worked or not worked, their age. It, there's a lot of factors that go into how long can they work in a way that you're improving the movement mm. and not working so long that you're fatiguing the body and starting to get back into patterns of compensation or struggle. Right. So that window of time is unique to each horse. And I would rather like every ride I have or even groundwork with a horse, I'm going to start off during the warm up phase with sort of the greatest amount of errors, mistakes mm -hmm. and struggle. Right. That's where we start. So then as I get through the warm up phase into something more productive, I feel the ease the horse is lighter to my aids, more responsive. The forces when they lose their balance or lose steering or lose the speed control or fall on the bit, they're just not as heavy. They're lighter. And the saddle is getting steadier and steadier. The whole movement of the horse is getting steadier. So if I only have 10 or 20 minutes, I'm still going in and working through old habitual patterns in the warm up and maybe beginning to build a better coordination in the horse. And maybe I only get five minutes of that better coordination, but you're training the nervous system. So to me, if I only have a limited amount of time, my goal is to get through the warm up into that improvement as rapidly as possible, which is just the path of least resistance, not necessarily becoming stronger as a rider but finding the path of least resistance for the horse to make an improvement. And then if I run out of time while the horse is still on that sort of upward trajectory of getting better during the ride, there's nothing wrong with that. It's better to end on a good note and sort of leave the horse in a way that they were interested in the work, they were feeling better, they're curious, and then they look forward to the next session. So, I agree with that. Yeah, I agree. And I, I like the way you put it that you, you have a little struggle in your warm up. And for me, it, it, for it's, and what did you say? Oh, the path of least resistance in your warm up. That's what I really like. Because for one horse, it might, if, if, if you've got one of my horses likes to go out like a bullet. So instead of trying to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's kind of like working with a two-year-old kid. Can I just distract maybe by using a lot of turns or something and, yeah. and like finding the path of least resistance um, to get to the good stuff. I really like, that's, a, that's great. I love yeah. that. There's horses that are very forward and have a hard time slowing down and their warm up mm -hmm. might be a loose rein at the trot figure eights, turns, right. changes, just an easy rising trot and let that energy sort of work itself out before, and then they're able to concentrate, right? Yes. So you, you can give minimal direction. Some horses, oh my God, you know, they barely get the handbrake mm. off and they start off so <laughs> slow. So warming them up in the walk is a better idea, right? where a horse that's sort of forward going, and there's no reason that you can't warm up in the canter, whether it's groundwork or riding. The canter is a very good warm up because 
the pelvis rotates forward naturally the most in canter. Mm -hmm. So for some horses to rotate that pelvis forward and sort of pull on the back muscles is the best warm up. It, and I refer to it like letting the kids out of the classroom into the playground. <laughs> yeah. Let them get all that stuff out before you start work. Absolutely. They might need a little bit of recess or a little bit of <laughs> venting before they're ready to concentrate. And that could be the warm up. Absolutely. Yeah. I know sometime I've actually gotten off one of my horses and because I couldn't find the path of least resistance and thought, well, maybe we just need to do groundwork to warm up. That could be. And again, some horses will do better and go through a warm up or make improvements faster without weight on their back, depending on their current condition. And other horses will do better with weight on their back. And so if we can't find that path of least resistance in the saddle, going back to groundwork or knowing this horse just has to be warmed up on the ground first, either for safety reasons Right. Or it's just physically the path of least resistance for that horse to kind right. of work the kinks out and start to be able to not only concentrate, but maybe work through tight muscles, maybe um, warm up in a way where their back is chronically tight and they need time without weight on it to really warm up the back muscles. So there's no right or wrong way to go about it. We get to know our horse. But as far as if I'm limited on time, I actually make more progress working horses for short periods of time more frequently than having long periods of time where the horse gets fatigued during the session and starts to either outmaneuver the rider right. or find patterns of compensation because they've fatigued the muscles that you're trying to work. Yeah, I think sometimes we forget when we are um, asking them these intense questions that if we're changing something and the way they're moving, they could have fatigue because they haven't used those muscles properly before. Absolutely. No, changing yeah. balance and changing posture. Like if you have a horse that's been chronically going high headed with the back pushing down, and you're suddenly working, figuring out how to change that chronic posture or that chronic habit of use to get the horse out of longitudinal extension with the spine. Then when the horse shifts, say, to long and low or comes into balance and begins flexing the spine, instead of a downward force through the back, you're starting to get a little bit of upward force through the back. That's very different muscle use for the horse. So that horse in the early stages might fatigue really quickly and recognizing fatigue. That's when we go, okay, we know we're done. That's all. That's the best I'm going to get out of this horse today. So whether I have, you know, fulfilled the hour that I had scheduled to me, it's not worth it anymore because I'm not going to get anything productive once the horse is fatigued in the way I want them to use themselves. How, how would you kind of know that? Because you talked about in the beginning, it's a little rough and we want the path of least resistance to get to the good stuff. And then you said you notice when they're fatiguing that you don't, they kind of go back into their old habits or yeah, it's, what would, I, I've seen some horses, um, I, I guess, shut down. I mean, they just, they won't go. Well, working on the mechanical coordination of the skeleton and changing posture, it is slow motion body work that's being done by the rider, right? I like that. I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> yeah. And, and so it is, it's just as powerful as having body work done on your horse, whether it's a chiropractic adjustment, massage therapy, some veterinary treatments. And so that change can be horses can get very fatigued from what seems like light work because the the muscles used in a new posture or a new mechanical coordination 
they might be very weak. And you're asking the horse not to use the muscles that they might have been using a long time while they were moving poorly. So in every ride, like let's say I have an hour, my warm up is where I'm going to experience the most amount of struggle. Right. So I'm looking for the path of re least resistance to get through the struggle. How do I know struggle? The saddle is unstable. I have, you know, the horse with kind of big, strong forces on the reins, mm -hmm. against yes. my legs, on my seat. It's big, it's strong, it's obvious. It's right? all big, big sloppy stuff is and, what I call it. It's yeah. messy. And it's big messy. mistakes. Big like mistakes. <laughs> veering off course, right? Blowing through your leg or rain. Big mistakes. Yeah. So then when I find the path of least resistance and I start to improve the use of the body, which is the balance, I feel those big mistakes become less intense. Right. So the frequency of my aids or my conversation between my contacts and aids, that frequency might become quicker, but the forces that I'm contending with are lighter. And I'm feeling more ease in the movement. So the saddle is more stable, easier to guide the horse, easier to stay on my path of travel or make speed adjustments or transitions. So as long as that's getting easier and easier and easier, the horse is still working in the new coordination comfortably. Then at a certain point, and this took me years to recognize fatigue, is when that starts to go back the other direction towards the warm up. So from the warm up, you start off with the problems and you go upward to easy, 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 easy. And then at a certain point, you hit a peak and it starts to go back down with an increase of mistakes, stronger forces, stronger corrections, bigger mistakes, more struggle, less stability in the saddle. So as soon as I get that feeling in a ride, I just know the horse is fatigued. And, and they've done the work I've asked them to do. That could be, it, it, you know, at the 20 minute mark of my ride or the 30 or 40 or 45, or maybe they last a whole hour. And at the 60 minute mark, I'm out of time, but they've been getting smoother, more responsive, more stable the entire ride. Then that was very productive. Do you ever work. see, do you ever see any kind of, of column come out say when they've had enough you broke up a little bit can you say that again when do you see sometimes any personality type traits that come up when you're pushing them or they're done you know like like my Callie will blow you know she'll just start snorting and blowing like I've had enough of this yeah I'm done you can, you can get other signs like if that feeling as a rider is subtle or unclear there's a lot of signs the horses will give us like my mare blowing through my leg dragging me back to the mounting block that's her <laughs> very clear sign that she's fatigued and we're done right you can have bit chomping, mouthy activity. You can see an increase of struggle rather than the mouth getting quieter, uh, right? So uh, in a warm one. up, a horse with a busy mouth might start off busy, but if you're really changing the balance positively, the mouth will become quieter and quieter. And then when it becomes busy again, they're starting to, that's a sign of struggle to me. Same thing if they start losing steering, going too fast and having a harder time slowing down or going too slow and having a harder time speeding up. One of the things a lot of them will do in this type of work is they'll just stop and put their head down and their <laughs> ears will be back. They'll be very quiet, but it's like the nervous system is sort of processing these changes in the body that they just did and there's a delay, like there's kind of a catch up moment. And yeah. a lot of them will do it. They'll just start stopping and they have like sort of a sleepy look on their face. They're not yeah. distracted, uh, not stopping and looking around. They're right. stopping and they're deeply kind of internal, internally focused.
And I've seen that with people with the Alexander work, you know, when the central nervous system starts to get coordinated and organized, there's like an aha moment. Yeah. Of, and of processing. It's just a, they're processing is what their people are doing. Yes, that's exactly what horses are doing. And I felt that in Alexander lessons with me, where there was some substantial change in my coordination. And I felt like I could just go face first, smack on the floor and fall asleep and take a nap. Like it yeah. was just overwhelmingly <laughs> tiring. And that's a nervous system fatigue, not necessarily a physical muscle fatigue. But, but that's when the horse starts stopping and really wanting to go to that deep, thoughtful place. That's another sign that you're kind of done. Yeah. Okay. And I just go, I've run out of horse for the day. He doesn't have anything left, so I'm done. Right. Or they could go back to that high-headed, distracted. Yes. You know, not listening to you anymore kind of thing. Yeah. If they go from really concentrating with you on this conversation and they suddenly become, and sometimes maybe the environment plays a role, but they'll where they could concentrate with the UPS truck going by 10 minutes ago, suddenly they can't. And that, you Good know, point. that distraction is a little bit of self-preservation kicking in. So when they feel fatigued, they're going to be more on alert for danger in the environment. Same happens with weak horses. When you're rehabbing, a lot of people think it's just, you know, the horse has no ability to concentrate, but when they don't feel safe in their own skin, when they feel physically mm. weakened, you'll get horses that are on high alert and more reactive because they don't have the self-confidence to deal with surprises in their environment. That's a really good point. Yeah, mm. they can. Um, Cause I know one of my horses, Callie could never be separated from the herd ever she would just totally lose it whereas now where she's come into a better state of balance the herd doesn't matter anymore yeah she feels I can pull safer her, yeah i can pull her out of the herd take her in the barn tack her up if she doesn't see the other horses she's fine now whereas before it was like that was a big deal big deal yeah. big deal so that's when you know you're making progress Absolutely. Because, it, you know, we call it barn sour, buddy sour, um, arena sour, blah, 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 right. all these things. But really, we have to get past, way past looking at horses behavior as obedient, disobedient, good or bad. Or personal. Or take it personally. Absolutely. Don't, it's not personal. <laughs> it's not personal. <laughs> No, because they, their sense of self-preservation as a prey animal species is incredibly high. So sometimes the environment can trigger it, but when they're hypersensitive to the environment, what that usually tells me is they don't feel safe on the inside. Exactly. Right. So that could be a pain issue. It could be a mechanical lameness issue. It could be a weakness in their body. It could be poor mechanical use of their body over a long period of time where they feel less stable, less strong, less able to defend themselves from something unexpected. And that can create, that in itself can create a lot of what we call behavioral issues or psychological problems. And it's just really that they don't feel strong and safe and self-confident in their bodies. Right. So they want the herd. They want to be where they feel safe. Right. So every behavior, good or bad, wanted or unwanted by the human is just <laughs> the horse talking to us. Right? Exactly. They're, just, they're just telling us what they think. And they're pretty honest and they're pretty brutally honest. Right. So that old adage, uh, a horse will buck off a king as quick as a groom. Like, I've never heard that one. <laughs> they don't give a shit who you are. They're going to tell you how they feel. <laughs> yeah. 
horse. Yeah. But they will and, buck off a king as quick as a groom. Uh, I And each horse expresses themselves differently. Yes. So I think it's like if the horse expresses its, its struggle or discomfort or even like a mental sort of struggle to understand what the rider wants, mm. they could be busy in the mouth. Right. So it's the first thing people do use a drop nose band or a flash, keep that mouth quiet. But it doesn't address the underlying issue or ask, it doesn't even ask the question, why is the horse struggling and expressing struggle through the use of the mouth? And that could be with the tongue going out. So then if the flash doesn't work or we don't like flashes, we start selecting different bits. We go bit shopping. And we go, <laughs> we go bridal shopping, right? Because we're so focused that the problem, because it is there, it, that the problem is local. Yeah, and because it's global. being expressed by the mouth. Right. I think the problem must be the mouth. And I go, no, the mouth can be expressing poor use of the back. The mouth could be expressing arthritis in the hocks or the stifles. It's just an expression of struggle. There's nothing good or bad. And actually, my same mare years ago, you know, you we you and I have learned by being the person who made all those mistakes. Right? <laughs> yeah. So my little Arabian mare who, you know, the colic surgery, and I've had her for 28 years. She was horrible. She was one of those busy, busy, busy mouthed horses, sticking her tongue out, acting like I was killing her if I took a rain contact. And I did the same thing. I bought about, I don't know, 20 or 30 different bits, <laughs> went through two or three different dentists, you know, <laughs> looked at doing everything, tried everything. And it wasn't until I understood, because she was quite tricky to get her habit as an Arabian was always pushing the back down in very tricky ways. And she was very wiggly. So I had lateral bending, rotation alignment issues as well. <clears throat> and once I addressed the stability in her back and hind quarter, her mouth got quiet. Didn't matter which bit. And some bits she liked a little better, some worse, but the mouthiness never went away until she found her stability where it should have been in her back and hind quarter. Hmm. And as long as she was unstable there, <clears throat> her mouth was busy no matter what I did. No matter and what. And that's I tried. almost like you like you um they're, they're distracting. They're being, that's their distraction. <clears throat> Even if you, you know, got the ears, they're still not totally with you if they're in that busyness. Yeah. And, you know, warm bloods get sort of the derogatory uh, term of dumb bloods, right? That's yeah. People call them dumb bloods. And part of the reason they call them dumb bloods is I think one of the it's a little bit breed specific. One of their defensive patterns or signals of struggle is distraction. I completely agree with that. And they will distract themselves to the point of disassociation. Yes. They <clears throat> dis I know what that's about. Excuse me. Just totally leave because they don't want to experience what's going on. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think I've noticed with warm bloods that just seems to be, and Arabs kind of do the same thing, like that hyper alertness to their environment. But that distraction can be a sign that they don't feel safe or that they're struggling with what you're asking them to do. You know, and thoroughbreds get the, what is it? TB, my sister says, stands for tiny brain. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that. Yeah. Or thoroughbreds have the reputation of the two brain cells chasing each other each around, other. <laughs> colliding once in a while. But that reputation of not thinking, right, or not having the ability to think because they're in the hot horse category, mm. really, again, is either we're not being provocative in a meaningful way to them. Good point. Right? So <clears throat> if we're not as riders or handlers or as the managing partner in our partnership with a horse, 
if we're not nailing it and helping the horse experience feelings of safety and comfort, then we're not very useful to them. Like that's all they really care about from the rider. <clears throat> I think that's so important. You bring up the point about the difference between warm bloods and um, Hot thoroughbreds. Bloods. I mm -hmm. have a, I had a situation where somebody thought that since they use spurs on their warm blood, that using spurs on their thoroughbred was okay. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. I, I bet that was exciting. <laughs> you should have seen the response. <laughs> yes. So that's a really good point. We're talking quality versus quantity. You know, that more, more is better. The, you know, the American way is. <laughs> I think it's human nature. That, is it, you think that it is? It's worked, it's just... more of it will be better. But, and that's what I love when we talk about or use the training terminology of balance. I go balance, an imbalance could be too much of something. Good point. It, could, it can also be too little of something, right? So the rider with the hot blood that has way too much forward and not enough brakes, too little brakes, that's no more, it, it's not enjoyable any more than the owner of the cold blood who has too much brakes and not enough forward. Both of those are imbalances, right? So cold bloods get that reputation because they tend to be less reactive, slower, quieter in temperament. But they can blow up and go into flight just like a thoroughbred. Yes. And that's a whole lot of horsepower when yes. you have a scared draft horse. Yes. Like that is a boatload of horsepower. Of horses. <laughs> and I've worked with many scared draft horses and they can act and be just as agile as thoroughbreds. They can be just as sensitive. So just because they're considered a cold blood breed doesn't mean that that individual draft horse is going to be somehow inherently less sensitive than a thoroughbred or an Arab that's in the hot horse category. And that brings it back to the point of really paying attention. So you've got your warm up where things are messy, but you want to remember, you don't want to stay there. That finding that path of least resistance, no matter what horse you're on, getting to the ease, the quiet, then you concentration. also concentration. Yeah, they're focused. They're with you, and everything. Just it kind of you. You become one. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the dream for all of us. Right? Yeah, Is and to have that dance partner. Yeah, and it, we think I know as an Alexander teacher when I'm working with people, um, the, the language that comes up is they always want to do it right, mm. and they want to hold on to it. Yeah, and people will look at training, even like you're saying, wanting to do it right and wanting to hold on to it. And that really dismisses the dynamics of yes. a body in motion. Like, first of all, we go, that's not possible. Exactly. It's not possible because the world is still spinning and forces are still interacting. So there is no static place of balance. But what balance is, is a moment of static equilibrium between opposing forces, right? So if you think what's important to a horse, whether you're a king or a groom, what's <laughs> important to the horse is feeling safe and moving in a way that's physically comfortable, especially if you're riding or driving or working the horse, right? So we're adding, it's not just like a dog or a cat, we're adding weight, we're asking horses to work like livestock. So their comfort in the work is super important, which is why <clears throat> understanding the mechanics and the forces at work is important. That's how we provide comfort during motion to horses. So in any session, if I start off in my warm up and my horse is having these big reactions screaming at me that they feel unsafe, then my first order of business, the question in my mind is, 
what can we do to help this horse feel safe on the inside? I think that's really important. Yeah. And I think to for the human to ask that question is what does the horse need instead of forcing them to do it maybe a way we think is going to work. I think for the human to be open to maybe I need to go back to groundwork, you know, or maybe I, I need to take time with this horse to let the horse's energy settle down. Right. Or maybe I need to lunge the horse, not to make them tired, but to just let them vent or express until they feel safe. That's different than chasing a horse around with a whip to get them tired. So if yes. I have a horse that doesn't feel safe, that's high energy, I might do my warm up on the lunge line, but I'm, I'm not doing anything but waiting for the horse to just kind of run it out. Exactly. And once they feel better, I go, okay, now that you feel better and if you feel safer, we can focus on getting you comfortable in work, which is where balance, understanding how to balance a horse comes into the work we do with horses. <clears throat> so if I'm riding, I might get on with a horse that's questioning its safety or moving in a way that's not comfortable for the horse or me. And I wanna find that path of least resistance basically to improve the quality and or the stability of the horse feeling safe and comfortable inside its own skin. Yes. That there's no amount of time I need to spend to achieve that. And I think riding a horse with those thoughts in mind is much safer in the long oh. run. A horse that feels safe inside is a safe horse for humans to be around. I, yeah, I keep getting yeah. on all of these uh, Facebook equestrian sites and the amount of, of horses spooking and people getting thrown. It just seems like it's over the top. So I'm wondering if this is a piece that's missing. Yeah, there's many horses that either come in to be started under saddle or for rehab. One of the biggest problems is opening the communication with the horse mm. by working with them in a way <clears throat> that they feel more safe by the end of the session, not just tired. And a lot of uh -huh. times, like take a horse, say a horse that doesn't want to move, it's uncomfortable in movement, <clears throat> a lame horse that needs rehab, you can't run them around on a lunge line or do mm -hmm. groundwork to get them to release pent up energy, right? But what we can do yeah. is play focus games, right? Or begin a conversation in a more controlled walk or something on the ground that just gets the horse's attention to us and allows that anxious or, or, or tension energy to dissipate. Right. So <clears throat> we can get the horse to focus on us. We can get the horse to focus on something specific. We can channel that mental energy to spend some of the emotional energy. So it doesn't always mean run the horse around until they're tired because and there's certain breeds, a lot of gated horses and or hot blooded horses. The more you run them around, the more jacked up they get. I was going to share <laughs> that, too. Yeah. Or that. If they get into that state they and stay there too long, I don't think they feel safe. Exactly. You're not, they're not creating, they need some intervention to say, hey, you know, let's try this or try this to right. see if we can redirect into a positive, like you said, find that path of least resistance. Um, and what I described about the horse sort of either expressing behavior or getting shaky in their movement or starting to have bigger corrections towards the end of a ride, that's the physical comfort signal that they're fatigued and we're done. Yeah. But the safety comfort or safety signals would be if I can't get the horse's attention on me, if I, you know, if they're high headed with tension or anxiety and their attention is everywhere, but on me, 
and the energy level is high, that's the horse screaming at me that they don't feel safe. And that's not a horse I want to get on. I don't know about you, but that wouldn't be my first choice. I get hired to get on horses like that a lot. I know you do. (laughs) It doesn't help the horse any more than it's safe for the rider. What helps the horse, even if you are getting on, you could walk them around first. You could spend time at the mounting block. You could just redirect their attention to say, hey, can we have a conversation? Can you put invisible blinkers on and just focus on me? And a lot of times that will help them settle down enough and reduce the energy that then it's safe to work on comfort or or they feel safe enough that they can focus on comfort. That's a really good point. Can we have a conversation instead of it just being us giving orders? Yeah. Yeah, the conversation happens through what we call our aids and our contacts, right? So an aid, a leg aid, a seat aid, a rein aid is when we're talking, we're actively increasing forces to give direction or resistance to what the horse is doing, ask for something specific. But people forget a contact, which is just a physical touch with our seat, Mm. our legs and our reins, is where we're listening. 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 So like horses that won't slow down, people have a constant rein aid holding them back. Mm -hmm. There's no rein contact. So there's no listening. It's all talking. And so pretty soon the horse just goes, you know, la, 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 la. I'm not listening anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Disassociate. (laughs) Right. Or just ignore it. Get used to the bit leverage. And the same happens with the leg aids for horses that don't want to go forward, the rider can be banging away with the legs or go to spurs or too hard, you know, too constant with the leg aid, which could be the whip or the spurs or whatever they use. But that constant driving or even the scooching of the seat as a forward aid, that constant aid, there's there's no room for listening. There's no more, there's no more contact because there's never a quietness where through our contacts, our soft tissues sense the forces and the directions of force. That's how we feel the energy and the balance and the mechanical use of the horse's body. So if we're just constantly giving aids, we're always talking and not listening. That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. And and when people do that to me, I just sort of like, my mind wanders off I go I quit listening because it yeah becomes a constant monologue it's no longer a dialogue it's not a dialogue it's not communicating it's uh, yeah yeah right cool so come back all the way around I think it's quality of work versus quantity of work is kind of the title of the podcast because Sometimes when we get very high quality, when we really make deep internal changes in ourselves or with the horses, maybe we don't need as much time during a training session. I like that. Yeah, I have found that if I, with the warm up, if it's another sign for me that I'm making progress is if my warm up time is shorter. Yes. Yeah, if the horse doesn't need, then I go, oh, oh, okay. Well, they're starting off better. Yeah, let's move forward with that. So you actually get to spend more quality time. Yes. Because you've made progress. It's also just like with you with Alexander work. You don't change people when they come in one time a week for an hour, right? It's what they become aware of during all their activities that makes the difference. And it's the same with horses, especially if if we have our own horses at home or when we go to the barn where we board them. The training doesn't start in the arena. Good point. The, The training starts the moment they sense our personal space. 
So that could be when we go to catch them, when we walk in the barn, if they're in the stall. Um, you know, I have like a whole workbook that I called basic handling because it's about overcoming defensiveness and building a sense of safety in basic daily tasks. You know, so putting up with feed aggression or pullbacks on the cross ties or pullback on a hitching rail or not being able to pick up horses' feet or have them dangerous for the vet, the farrier, uh, even trailer loading and unloading. I go, all of that is training, all of that. And if the horse doesn't feel safe and starts to escalate with defensive energy in the context of any basic handling, I go, those are training opportunities. Yes. And maybe in a safer environment too, if you're picking up at that level. Absolutely. So every time we interact with a horse, we're training, right? And, and they're always telling us as soon as we can observe them, what their energy level is, high or low, where they're looking with their eyes and ears pointed, how much um, tension or anxiety they have, how calm they are, how cooperative they are or lack of it. All of that is communication from the horse. And so it doesn't just start once we fork a leg over their back or do groundwork, it's happening all the time. Yes. And if we're not listening, if we're not listening there, be, might be pretty grandiose yeah. <laughs> yes. for the human anyway. But also <laughs> if we're not accustomed to listening to the horse, it's not going to be easy once we're riding. Right. Because once we're riding or handling a horse on the groundwork, either it's that horse becomes a, a huge point of focus. It, it's hard to control ourselves with this great big stimulus, right? When we're riding or driving, it affects our balance and our safety. So it's even harder to control our reactions. So if we're not accustomed to listening to our horses, because even on the ground, the inactivity of our body is a contact. It's just mm -hmm. a listening point, right? So we can do that from the moment we show up and then we're more used to it in the context of building a conversation with our horse as a rider. And I think that's what's really helped me is the Alexander work. Because if, what if, you know, the, the rider doesn't feel comfortable in their own body? Exactly. It's the same for the horse. Right. No, and during cold weather and bad times of year, like now, when we yeah, can't really. ride, there's all of that self-control over our own, like mental focus, emotional state, or our own body use, which is where working with an Alexander Technique instructor is hugely helpful for the riding. Because that body awareness is what leads to the self-control that improves our aids and contacts improves our balance in the saddle and so and it's something we work on all the time not just when we're riding or when we're at a lesson or even for people like we think we have to go to the gym to work out I go oh there's a if you own a farm you're working out all the time <laughs> yeah I was out there mucking this morning it was 11 degrees that's a workout yeah. for me it's a workout <laughs> No, you get your cardio, you get your weightlifting. Yes. Frozen poo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I think we can wrap it up there. And I think it is a good topic to really think about the quality of our interactions with the horse, mm -hmm. whether it's the, you know, and helping the horse find the quality of feeling, which you can't make a horse do through leverage or tactics. You can't make them feel safe. And you can't make them feel comfortable. You have to ask questions and let the horse tell you, which exactly. is how you find the path of least resistance. But really looking at the quality of how the horse feels, do they feel safe? Do they feel comfortable? It's a huge question to ask. And, and when you have a lot of time to spend, I love spending more time with my horses, but if they're done, they're done. I go, there's no use in me pushing it when they show me that they're through all these different things we've talked about, if they're fatigued, we're not going to get anything productive done from that point forward. Yeah. And it could be mental, emotional, or physical. 
fatigue. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to be listening to know what you're hearing. Absolutely. So good. Cool. So, um, hit the like button, subscribe. We will be back on track with our <laughs> podcasts on a, on a weekly basis, more or less. And we hope you enjoy it. Uh, please comment or share, ask questions, and we will see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Be kind. <laughs>